It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Kristen Goodfellow, RDH. She obtained her Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Studies from West Virginia University. Due to a high interest in the dental field, Kristen decided to continue her education and enrolled in Algany College of Maryland's Dental Hygiene Program, where she completed her Associates of Science degree in Dental Hygiene. At graduation for outstanding chair-side education, Kristen was chosen by instructors to receive Procter & Gamble's Excellence in Patient Communication Award. This recognized her unique combination of skills and inspired her further herself in her field, utilizing her ability to help patients understand treatment and total body health. Kristen is still practicing dental hygiene in the state of West Virginia. She believes that successful treatment outcomes begin with accurate assessment, which leads to a co-diagnosis between the patient and the dental team. Dedicated to raising the standard of care and with enthusiasm about the dental profession, Kristen seeks out challenging opportunities where she is able to utilize her skills in both communication and dentistry for the success of the organization. She receives training and education from top-notch programs such as Hygiene Mastery, which she attributes her beliefs of comprehensive and quality they don't care too. And she's named after my favorite movie, The Goodfellas. That was a, uh, <laughs> did you ever see that movie? Yes, it's one of my favorites. It's my, one of my, favorites. <laughs> my gosh, when you raise uh, four boys, my boys are uh, 21, 23, 25, 27. So, uh, you know, you have to watch, you know, The Godfather, The Goodfellas, all the oh, war yeah. movies. Casino, uh, but, uh, all the good gangster movies. You know, I like, uh, I like, uh, you know, I'm 54. You're uh, the same age as my oldest son, uh, Eric. And uh, I, I love, um, I love talking to young, fresh hygienists, young, fresh dentists. Um, what, what's got you excited and passionate about dental hygiene? You know, I'm, I'm really lucky because right out of school, I got in with a great dental practice. Um, Dr. Robert Martino owns seven, eight dental practices here in the state of West Virginia. Started working for him and he introduced me to things like fortune practice management um, and Tony Robbins, hygiene mastery. I just got really lucky and kind of he has a very high standard of care. So as a young dental hygienist, you know, that really translated onto me and has really overall affected my career. Um, I'm at the point now where I represent a mouth rinse um, with him, uh, Oracare, and it that's what really has me excited. It's something new. It's an alternative to traditional products like chlorhexidine, um, not having to deal with the staining or the calculus buildup anymore. This is something that we can use long term, can be used every day, and keep our patients healthier longer. Well, you know, one of the first things I noticed when I was your age and um, practicing dentistry is that some patients would come in and we used to do four quadrants to replaying curatage, four quadrants of gum surgery. They never changed their behavior. They never changed their attitude. And two years later, you were back to square one. And then there were other people that did not accept the treatment. They didn't have insurance. They didn't have the money, whatever. But they're, you know, they, they got motivated and they started brushing and flossing and their home care went through the roof. And two years later, they looked a heck of a lot better than the people that got the surgery and the replaying cure dust. So if, if any, um, that's why I was confused when, um, you know, that crest got in trouble because it had those little blue dots in there. Right. And I thought, <laughs> you know, are, are we really that, you know, maybe the blue dots is the only thing that makes the little boy brush his teeth. <laughs> You know, That's very true. Yeah. I, I mean, how many how many people? You know, I mean, I'm sure they put it in there for a reason to make the toothpaste whiter, brighter, sexier, funner, cleaner, better tasting, and motivation is everything. How how do you how do do you think this uh, Aura Care products? Do you think it helps motivate patients, or is it purely the the products ingredients? You know, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that it's something a little bit different for patients. It's a two bottle system um, because the active ingredient is actually chlorine dioxide. Um, now that's something that I don't necessarily tell my patients. Um, however, if they read on the bottle, they're gonna see that. But what makes it unique is that our patients, instead of just utilizing a, a mouth rinse that they would get over the counter anywhere, um, they're actually utilizing a gas in their mouth with this. So it's able to penetrate the whole mouth, the sides of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the back of the throat, and approximately where you know they don't need to floss anymore. Um, what they're what, what all those studies are saying now, uh, but it's able to really help a patient. That whenever I used to recommend things like chlorhexidine, um, it, there was always that big struggle with patient compliance because of something like taste. Even if my patients don't love the taste of this rinse, they love the way that their mouth feels. They can feel a noticeable difference. So I think that's motivating for them. Um, 
especially my young patients, I have young patients and braces that this works for, all the way up to my, you know, older, more advanced periodontal patients. Um, I use this throughout my practice um, with dental hygiene, um, whether it's just trying to keep a patient healthier or they have full-blown periodontal disease. Well, I just went to your website, and I see you're on Twitter also, Dentist Select, at DentistSelect.com. I just gave you the big uh, a, 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 we, a retreat. Is that what they call it, a retreat? So, so who's the doctor you said you work for? So I work for Dr. Robert Martino, but there's actually um, many people that were involved when elevating Oracare. Um, Dr. Richard Downs is an incredibly intelligent man um, that can give you the the deep, in-depth science that some people love. Um, and then there's uh, Dr. Birch, who works up in Boston. All three of them kind of came together to create this really unique rinse that is really powerful and can be used um, for patients to really keep them healthier um, without having to deal with the side effects. And I think as a hygienist, that's something that I've been seeking out um, in my career. And, you know, I've, I'm a young hygienist. But I speak to hygienists at all these different conventions, women and men who have been practicing for years and years and years, that everyone's kind of frustrated with chlorhexidine. We're all looking for something that has that same bacterial effect, but without all of those side effects. And I think that Oracare offers that, and that's why it's so exciting for everyone in the dental community. So when did they start Oracare? So Oracare started around 2012. Um, Actually, I think it's actually 2011. Um, I actually walked into the practice that Dr. Martino owns and had to start using Oracare. And at first, you know, being a hygienist, I was a little questionable. I didn't know. I'm like, oh, is this just one of those things that somebody wants me to sell to my patients until you see it, how it works? I mean, once I was recommending it, you know, you get on board with maybe start using it with something like bad breath. We pre rinse in our practice. If your patient walks in with bad breath, you normally would be trying to put on two or three masks, putting toothpaste under your nose, all kinds of different things. Um, if you pre rinse that patient, I guarantee you're not going to smell that oral malodor coming from their mouth. I mean, it's amazing. That's one of those, that was one of the first things that I noticed. And then I started utilizing it with my perio patients. Um, and that's where I really saw the difference. That's what made me a real believer. And I do webinars for the product to help offices kind of learn how to utilize this in your practice because we kind of fall into a regular routine in dentistry. You know, don't want to go outside your little box. And this is definitely something outside the box a little bit. Um, so I really like to do the webinars to teach um, op different offices how they can maximize this because this is only sold in dental practices. Patients aren't able to get this anywhere else. So you are their only opportunity to have a great standard of care. You know what? After uh, I paid off my ex-wife, uh, I want bad breath. I stopped using deodorant. I stopped brushing my teeth. I don't wear perfume. Nothing. I I'm just market then. <laughs> I figure uh, it's going to save me a lot of money. I never want to uh, write a check like that again. Um, so, um, why why is it um, why is it good for the practice? Well, you know, I'm a hygienist, and I'm lucky in the the aspect of I don't have to worry about the business model of a dental practice. But this can be a passive income center for a dental office. So being that we're only sold in dental practices, this was created by dentists for dental professionals. Um, you know, this is something that can really add value to not only your hygiene department, but your op side. I mean, this can be a profitable income center because you aren't competing with Walmart, Walgreens, Rite Aid, all those big chain stores. I think even as a hygienist, it's very hard for dentists to carry a product because they're being undersold by all these big stores. You can't carry Listerine. You can't carry any Crest products because all those large chain stores are able to undersell you if it's something that you want to carry. Um, and what I really like, I think, as the hygienist, again, is I'm the dental professional. I want to have control over what Mrs. Jones is purchasing um, because I know she's going to the store and buying whatever's on sale. Um, or what a lot of men tell me is they, they buy whatever or they use whatever their wife buys. So whatever their wife is bringing home, that's what they're going to use. Huh. Well, you're, um, you're a woman. You, um, I don't have hair, so I don't get my hair cut and see hair care products, all that. But Many other vertical sectors of the economy, like uh, hair salons, uh, sell all kinds of product. 
um, mm -hmm. I noticed that, um, you know, you, you see that in other verticals. What, what other verticals do you see where they sell um, product? Uh, hair? Hair. I mean, I, you know, I think more dermatologists sell kind of product. Oh, that's right. My dermatologist, that, that's correct. When um, I, I live out here in Arizona and, uh, you know, skin cancer, you want to make sure that to prevent that, that you have uh, brown hair, brown eye, brown skin. I'm zero for three. So she says I'll probably <laughs> die of a melanoma. So I go in there and get checked once a year. But you're right. She tries to sell me and she does successfully probably the most expensive um, sun protection factor. And I always buy it and give it away to someone. I've never used sun protection factor one time in my entire life. Uh, but I, she sells it. So hair, dermatology, uh, what else? You know, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not even really sure. Um, I, cause I always think about it in dentistry is I don't even feel like I'm selling something just like I don't feel like I'm selling a crown necessarily. I'm recommending the highest standard of care. So I don't want to compromise my standard of care because I think some people get really caught up in feeling like they're selling products or selling dentistry. I talk about dentistry all day long and I guess part of it is selling, but you have to tell patients what their options are. Um, and that's always what I try to do. As far as what other places people are trying to sell stuff, I mean, I feel like that's depending on what you're walking into. You know, you could do you know, hair, you can do nails. I mean, as a woman, I feel like they're constantly throwing stuff at me. Does nail salon places uh, try to sell you stuff? Um, I mean, they, you know, if you get a pedicure, there's always a better pedicure. <laughs> there's oh, always they try to upsell the service. Pedicure. Yes. So okay. I, don't, I don't look at it as upselling a service. I look at it as, you know, I've seen the results with this with patients and I know that this is going to help them. I uh, actually uh, get a lot of mani pedis because my little brother's gay and it's one of the activities that he likes. And I always think it's funny where you know, they're always trying to ask you if you want uh, the upgrade for the sea salt thing or whatever. And I'm just like, yeah. like who, who in the world would want sea salt rubbed in their cab? But if my brother, I just get whatever my brother's getting. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I don't like, uh, I, I think when dentists say they don't like to sell dentistry, to me, it's a, it's a red flag that they, they're not excited about dentistry. I mean, when you, when you look at the humans, I mean, Sapien is going to spend every dime they get their hands on. I mean, at the end of the month, they're going to run out of money. I mean, you know, we don't even have a 5% savings rate in this country or any other country. So they're going to spend all their money. So if they don't spend it on um, getting their teeth cleaned, uh, or uh, dental care products, they're going to sell, you know, they're going to buy it in cheeseburgers, fries, and whatever they sell at the mall. And I, I just think that uh, um, they're going to spend all their money anyway, and it's dentistry's job to get them to spend their money on better things that they would buy at the mall. I mean, it's all discretionary income. It's all right. discretionary spending. Um, so on this product of chlorine dioxide, why are you, uh, what is the difference between uh, stabilized chlorine dioxide and activated chlorine dioxide? Why, why does this chlorine dioxide uh, make you uh, more excited than others? <laughs> so there's, there's a difference, and it's not that products that have stabilized chlorine dioxide in them are bad. They work fairly well. Um, you can get most of them over the counter, but what you're really utilizing is not really stabilized chlorine dioxide. Chlorine dioxide is a gas, so it can't be created with a single bottle or contained in a single bottle. Um, so what you're actually utilizing, if you take that to a chemist or someone who studies those kinds of things, what they're going to tell you that you're giving your patients to use is sodium chloride. Still works fairly well, but we have University of Iowa studies on our website, um, independent studies that show us, you know, that they work, but not as well. So if you look at those studies, you can see there's a really nice graph showing the difference between stabilized and activated chlorine dioxide. When you use a two bottle system like Oracare offers that is going to create that gas each time, you get a higher effect from that. Um, being a gas, again, it's able to penetrate the whole mouth, sides of the tongue, floor of the mouth, back of the throat, in between the teeth. So you're getting more effectiveness from a gas because it's able to penetrate those nooks, crannies, crevices, all those places that you and I are telling our patients, this is where you need to be flossing and reaching with the water pick. This is something to help them, something to add to their toolbox. It's never going to replace those things, but it can definitely help. Um, and that's the difference between activated and stabilized chlorine dioxide. Usually stabilized chlorine dioxide is in a single bottle. Um, when you have two bottles, you know you're at least trying to create that.
Um, that's also one reason why we say that we are professional rinse. We are only sold in dental practices. So you can expect professional type results with something like Oracare, more immediate, faster results. Um, much like what I consider over the counter whitening versus in office whitening. Over the counter whitening, you can get a good result from it takes a little more time it doesn't tend to last as long but if you do that whitening in office you're going to see results that day um, and it's hopefully going to last your patient a little bit longer it's a little bit more of an investment and you know if, if someone always came back and got their hair done because that's where you bought the vital saloon or salon or whatever what, the, the the product whatever um you know because my um my biggest reality check on the state of dentistry today i mean dentists want to talk about like uh and that corporate dentistry is a threat or uh, or Obamacare uh, um, having children covered by their medical insurance or, you know, they, they, they think of everything except for the fact that if how many days a week do you work seeing patients? So I, I am lucky because I work um, with Dr. Martino. He kind of lets me cover as needed and I have two scheduled days a month, but usually I'm working around four or five days a month uh, practicing clinically still. OK, so the average hygienist uh, I read does four days a week. Is that what you read? So yeah. So if she works um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, eight to five, that's thirty-two hours a week. Uh, you clean everybody's teeth twice a year. So in uh, the first half of the year, uh, fifty-two weeks in a year, we'll give the hygienist two weeks vacation. So uh, she's going to work thirty-two hours a week cleaning teeth for twenty-five weeks. That's eight hundred patients can come in Monday through Thursday, eight hours a day uh, for half a year. Then she's going to clean them all again. So a uh, hygiene capacity is 800. If she worked five days a week, it would still only be 1,000. And But the average is 800, and the average dental office gets 25 new patients a month. So that means every two and a half years, you'd add another four-day-a-week hygienist. But every dental office I see, uh, the dentist has been practicing 10 years, and he still has that one hygienist. You come back at 20 years, still has that one hygienist. Comes back at 30 years, still has that one hygienist. So it's mathematically as obvious as gravity that every time a hygienist cleans a new patient, someone came off for schedule. So they're just every, so we have 211,000 dentists in America just burning and churning patients. Every single dentist in America wants new patients. You just, you'll never meet a dentist says, I'm sorry, we don't accept new patients. Uh, doctor's been here for 10 years. We, you know, we're, we've completely reached our capacity. So anything that can close the back door like a dam, like Boulder Dam, you know, dam up that Colorado River and build this big practice filled with water. So if, if do you think the Oracare products, do you think people might want to come back to your office instead of go to another new office because maybe they, they get their Oracare products from you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have patients, you know, we being that we only sell to dental offices, I have patients calling me directly here at Oracare trying to buy it off of me because maybe they didn't like their dentist. They don't want to go back to that one. Um, or, um, they don't have anybody else in their area. So, th but they have to drive an hour to their dental office. I hear that a lot in like California, um, even here in West Virginia. Uh, you know, I have patients, we're a very high Medicare, Medicaid population, low income state. I have patients that will drive up to an hour to see me that they're they are calling me trying to get this product into their hands just at a more convenient rate to the point where we are selling Oracare and three bundle packs in our offices so that we can give our patient that so that you know that's going to last them at least six months because Oracare lasts a box of Oracare lasts about two if you're on a six month recall you don't want to have to drive that hour back every two months to pick up your Oracare they'll buy all three at one time. So and, and I, what and what is that three and how much does it cost? Is it is it three packages of two bottles or, or how does it work? Yeah, it's three packages of two bottles. Um, so we do a bundle package of it's three for a hundred dollars. Typically, what we recommend that you sell or care for is at least forty dollars a set. You're getting thirty two ounces of usable product with this. That's going to last your patient at least 120 uses, um, which is usually around two months. Now that's if only one person in the household's using it. A lot of times what happens is, you know, their husband or wife really like it and they'll start using it. So they go through it a little faster. Um, but here in West Virginia, Dr. Martino has eight dental practices. We average about 600 bottles a month between the eight practices and we sell it for $42 a set. Um, and I never, I always tell people that statistic and it's not so much to tell you, you know, oh, you look how much we can sell. It's 
the fact that if we can do that volume, the price is never stopping you from selling a product. It's your belief system. You have to know and believe in the product and you can sell it. I have offices that sell this for as high as $67. Now, do I think I could get that in West Virginia? I don't know, but if you would have asked me five years ago if I'd be selling a Malfrance for $40, I probably would have said no way. Uh, but once you see the amazing results that you can get with this product, you will think that $42 is a steal or $40 is a steal. I mean, we um, sell this at a really high volume and I absolutely think that patients will come back to your practice because you carry this product. And what's funny in the hair salon is they're selling all these uh, shampoos and conditioners and hair is dead and you're reading the bottle, you know, they're talking about revitalizing and rejuvenating. It's like, uh, okay, this stuff works. Why don't you just go to a cemetery, open up the casket and start pouring it on people. I mean, uh, you know, people are, uh, hair is dead. Uh, but yeah, that, that is amazing. So, so it sounds like Robert Martino, uh, that's his name, Robert Martino. Yeah. Uh, sounds like he's an amazing person. He has eight practices. Yes. Does he have a yes. bunch of partners or does he own them all and everybody's an associate? So uh, he, I think everybody is kind of partners, certain oh, dentists, okay. certain offices. I think after they're here for so long, he, now I don't deal with that side of things, so I could yeah. be completely wrong on this, so don't quote me, but um, I'm pretty sure after, you know, after you've been here for a while, he'll offer you a partnership in there, yeah. um, but I'm, I'm, I don't deal with that side of things. So well, that, that's, a, that's an amazing thing because that's the group practice model that I see working. I mean, when, whenever I go into a small town in the Midwest or West Virginia or whatever, and there's a, a, a group practice went to three or four or five locations, they get big enough uh, to be able to have a full-time person in HR and marketing and accounting and finance. And, and they just get big enough to have that one layer of management and I, I think going bigger in a small market is, a, is an intense uh, competitive advantage. What I don't understand is when you have these uh, group practices in, you know, 30 states and they have to support a national branch that takes, you know, a good, you know, 10, 15 uh, percent off the top. I don't see the value that top layers have. But I do agree that solo practitioners um, you know, they just don't really get the scales of economy to have um, the sophisticated HR, accounting, finance, uh, what have you. Um, so wh well, how is this an alternative to chlorhexidine gluconate? I mean, Paradex was the first biggie uh, that was uh, one time owned by Procter & Gamble. Then they sold that off to, I believe, someone in, was it Savannah, Georgia, or uh, the Omni people? Do you know who bought that? You know, I'm honestly, I, think, I honestly am not sure. I don't I think, know who so. So that that was the uh, that was the big rinse for periodontal disease uh, before you were born and I was your age. Uh, so how how do you like uh, your uh, this versus chlorhexidine and gluconate? Well, it's funny that you say that because it's still used everywhere. I mean, that's what I learned in school: chlorhexidine during scaling and replanning. That's what you give them. Um, but now, being out of school and you know you go to CE courses and you hear all of these different things, um, and they're finding out all this new information. But really. Whenever we look at chlorhexidine versus chlorine dioxide, activated chlorine dioxide, what we love about chlorhexidine is its antibacterial properties. It kills the bacteria, it has this long antimicrobial effect. However, with Oricare or with activated chlorine dioxide, what it takes chlorhexidine 1200 parts per million to kill, it is actually able to kill with only 36 parts per million. So it's much less, much less invasive. Your patients are able to be on this long term and it doesn't cause those side effects, but it's also something they can use throughout treatment. Chlorhexidine is really only recommended to be used for two weeks. So you'd use it for initial therapy, then you're recommending something over the counter um, and it's not working. So then you try something else and that's not working. So you know, by a year goes by, you've seen your perio maintenance patient three or four times, you're still trying to figure out what rinse that's going to work for them. This is something that there is no transition period. You use it during scaling and root planning, you use it throughout their treatment, and they can use this lifelong. And if, you know, their husband who doesn't have periodontal disease wants to use it, they can, they can use it as well. So it's really beneficial all around. Uh, and I, I just want to say to my viewers, um, remember that um, I called Kristen. She didn't call me. Uh, this isn't a commercial. No one's paid any money. There's been no exchange of money. I just like... Um, some, some dentists um, um, will, will not like it if you talk about a product. And I always tell dentists, when I started Dental Town in 1998, I don't even want to ask what year you were born. What, what year were you born? 1988. 
Okay, so you were 10 years old. That makes me feel better. I don't I don't feel uh I am a grandpa of a 4-year-old Taylor Marie who's uh I have to say almost as cute as you. Um but when we started Dental Town in 1998, a lot of dentists didn't want any dental manufacturers on there cuz they said they'd be selling something. And I said to them, I said, "Well, if you take away 500 dental companies, I'm sitting outside on a rug with whatever they sell at Home Depot, and I'm not doing fancy root canals, fillings, and crowns, and what have you. And I said, if all the dentists are on the website saying they wish this product was red instead of blue, I said, the manufacturers have to see that conversation. And if they can't see that conversation, they, they can't adjust and change the color from red to blue. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm not afraid of uh, dental products, and I, I, I think, uh, and I also can tell just by your energy and karma that this is your this is motivating you and this is enthusiasm and passion for you um you mentioned uh, you just threw out a, a can of worms you said the word husband um i think it's still hilarious that um on this planet um when i was in college was when uh, the aids thing broke out and um it was uh, i believe it was uh oh gosh darn what was the year that uh but anyway it was i graduated in 87 i think it was 1979 uh, they uh, found two guys with capsid sarcoma in a Los Angeles hospital dying of it. And capsid sarcoma, you should have been very old, and they were very young. But the, the, the person geniusly realized they were also gay. So he had two very rare things. So he mm-hmm. called the CDC, and the minute he told the CDC, I got two young boys, they both are dying of capsid sarcoma, and they're both gay. The CDC says, there's something there, you know. And uh, now, because of HIV and AIDS, the entire planet knows that humans transmit diseases below the belt. You know, all the STDs, you know, all that stuff. But I still think it's, it's almost sad that you can go into a dental office and they've cleaned grandma's teeth every three months for 10 years and treating her for gum disease and chronic gingivitis the whole nine yards, and they've never seen grandpa. And then you go look at grandpa and he's got, you know, two partials. He's got, you know, just a mouthful of tartar and crap. And he kisses her every night. And it's like, okay, well, if you saw grandma every three months for chlamydia for 10 years, would it ever dawn on you that maybe grandpa is carrying chlamydia? You know, wouldn't you treat them together? And what's so even more sad is some periodontists say, no, that, that has nothing to do with this. Like, dude, you can't have P. gingival. I mean, P. gingivalis doesn't evolve out of empty space in your mouth. I mean, this right. life form came from somewhere. Um, you weren't born with it. How did, how did, I mean, if I found a cockroach in my mouth, no one would say, wow, a cockroach evolved in Howard's mouth. They'd say, <laughs> no, it came from somewhere. And I, I, think, uh, I think it's funny how people still don't see perio as a communicable kissing disease. Um, is, um, people are sharing it on their utensils. You see it more in families. I mean, there are families that don't have this disease and there are entire households where it has a disease and you still have dental offices just saying, oh yeah, we just see one person out of five in this house. And then what's really sad is um, then their daughter lives at home and she's 20 and she just had a kid and now the kid is living in a home with a mom that hasn't had their teeth cleaned in years and then grandma's sitting there getting her teeth cleaned every three months but grandma's ki- grandpa's kissing on that baby too and no one's having a conversation that, hey, if we're going to bring a new life into this house, I need everybody in this office. I need I need to eradicate all this disease. I want to get rid of all streptococcus mutans, P. gingivalis. You know, don't share utensils and talk about uh, the transmission of this disease. Did they talk about that to you much? Uh, when did, how many years have you been in a hygiene school? I graduated dental hygiene school in 2013. So again, I'm a I'm still a new hygienist. So I've been out three years. Yes. Did they, yeah. when you were in hygiene school three years ago, did they talk much about the, this, the transmission of disease from mouth to mouth? Yeah, a little bit. I can remember mainly talking about us mutants, more so the periodontal disease. You know, you know, the baby has a, a binky in, the binky falls out, falls on the floor, mom picks it up, puts it in her mouth, and then puts it back in the baby's mouth. So, you know, I even think of that, you know, myself, uh, you know, I have, I'm high caries risk. I should feel like I should have fluoride trays in my mouth, you know, 24 seven. Um, I'm constantly trying to. Why are you de- high caries risk? Well. It's because you just got married and you're kissing that man every day. So I get, I, that must be it. Except he doesn't have any cavities. So I'm going to give him cavities. Actually. So, so why are you high caries risk then? Um, well, I think growing up, you know, I grew up in a very uh, rural Pennsylvania, small town. 
You know, my grandmother had dentures at 15 years old. Your, um, your grandma? My grandmother. Okay. Yes. So, um, and both grandparents on both sides had dentures. There was, my dad was terrified of the dentist. My mom didn't start going to the dentist until she was about 17 regularly. When she was younger, she grew up on a farm. When the tooth hurt, you pulled it and that was it. Um, same way with my dad. So, you know, going to the dentist as a kid slowly grew in importance as they, you know, started taking us every six months. Um, you know, the hygienist and the doctor sitting there educating them, telling them, you know, they have to come. That, you know, growing up, I my mom's going to kill me if she ever sees this. <laughs> But I can remember my mom putting soda in, like, my sippy cup as a kid. Um, I grew up on iced tea. We didn't drink water. Um, so I can never show this to my mom. She's going to be ter horrified. But, I mean, that's the reality that I lived. And coming here, you know, I live in West Virginia, and there's all kinds of jokes that people make about West Virginia. Um, but, you know, being a hygienist here, I have parents coming into my operatory with a couple of kids, and they're sitting there drinking Mountain Dew. Um, you know, I've seen uh, bombed out decay on a six-year-old molar on a, on a six-and-a-half-year-old kid. Um, I think that, you know, as a child growing up, I didn't have that, that I try to educate my patients a lot as, as well as their parents to let them know because, you know, I've, I, every single tooth in my mouth and the back has been filled. So I'm at high, I'm high caries risk because I've had more than five cavities in my lifetime. Wow, you and I are uh, twins. Uh, I was uh, had the same story uh, from Kansas. I mean, all my uncles and everybody, they, uh, you know, in Parsons, Kansas, when you had a toothache, you just went to the uh, dentist and they pulled it. And yep. uh, I mean, uh, they were, uh, most all of them had full dentures before they got married. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they were, they were getting at 15, 16, 17. I mean, it's just uh, unbelievable. And uh, when they come into my office, uh, you know, I'm in Phoenix. I'm not in Scottsdale. I'm not in Paradise Valley. I'm not in Sun Lakes. I'm in, I'm in Phoenix. And 25% of my five-mile radius speaks Spanish as the primary language. Um, you know, if you're, um, you know, uh, from another state, I'm sure you'd call a quarter of my patients illegal aliens. I'm still, I'm still not sure what an illegal alien is since uh, <laughs> uh, America stole 40% uh, of Mexico. They stole Tejas which is, has cities called San Antonio and El Paso. They stole New Mexico, Arizona, California, where the cities are named, San Jose, San Francisco, Los Angeles. I mean, I mean to steal 40% of Mexico and then say you're going to build a wall to keep these people coming to the land that you stole from, but they, they come in with Mountain Dew and eating Funyuns. Mm -hmm. And I, they're all Catholic. Uh, most Latinos are Catholic, and I just tell them, I say, hey, would you take your bong to church? <laughs> I said, if you, I, you know, I that reference. you know, you don't, you don't take Mountain Dew to a dental office any more than you take your bong to church. You know what I mean? I mean, there's some things that are sacred and nobody takes their bong to church and you just don't take Mountain Dew. And I also want to say another thing about that sippy cup. That's another conversation that, you know, people don't talk about the transmission of the disease. Um, you know, these babies are all born without it. And, and we kiss them and get our saliva in their mouth with a, you know, a kiss can have 300 species of bacteria, fungus, and viruses transmitted in a kiss. And I remember when I was little, I had two grandmas. You know which one was my favorite grandma? I, well, they're both passed away, so I can say. But it was actually Grandma Nola because she would peck you on the forehead. Grandma Mary would give you a kiss on your mouth where you would take your entire arm to wipe the saliva off. And you're just like, oh, my God. And you're like shaking crap on the floor. It's like, my gosh. It's just, you didn't want to kiss from Grandma Mary. Um, but it, it, um, the other thing no one talks about, you, you know what's really bizarre about that sippy cup? Is what's the that? same thing, the bottle. The sippy cup pours volume of fluid into your mouth. And when you dig up uh, human beings, 400 years on back, there was zero malocclusion. Nobody had all these cross bites and narrow arches and all this stuff. And now they know that the um, up until 400 years ago, we were all were tenaciously nursing. You know how you meet some girls and say, well, I wasn't doing very well nursing, so I switched to a bottle. So a bottle, very little effort, big volume of milk, sloshing down everything, so they don't develop their arches. When you can't nurse very well, that baby with the tugging and all the pressure and all that stuff, you were supposed to nurse for a couple of years, and the food 
was very uh, rough too and lots of chewing and all that stuff. And that's why their arches and muscles and face developed. And when we went to soft foods and sippy cups and bottles, then this whole country has to ship all their kids through 12,000 orthodontists for two years um, because th th there shouldn't even be a sippy cup. A sip and, and, and why do we have a society that doesn't know that a sippy cup means that 15 years later, you're going to have to go spend 6,000 bucks on Invisalign and you're going to have uh, breathing issues and, and nasal breathing and all this stuff. I mean, we really, uh, um, there's so much exciting stuff about prevention. That's what I love about your passion about Orcare products because you feel you're preventing disease. What is the most surprising thing that you learn um, getting involved with Orcare? I think, you know, with Orcare, you know, that's, Oracare is an outlet for me to do the educational part that I really enjoy. You know, I am still a hygienist. I still practice. I would practice still every day if I thought I could do both. But I really like um, the educational side of things. And what surprises me the most um, about Oracare is actually what it does for things like dry mouth and mouth sores. So how it can really benefit cancer patients. Um, you know, a lot of times our cancer patients they aren't able to do a lot, especially if they have any kind of head or neck cancer. Um, so I like to give them Oracare because it's helping with the dry mouth. It's helping keeping those sores away to the point where we have cancer foundations picking this product up to give to those patients. Because at that point, you know, it's more about comfort. And I love being able to feel like I'm giving someone that offers them a form of comfort. Um, it also has great properties as far as being antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, removes VSCs, and cuts through biofilm. So you can imagine when something can do all of that, what it can really help prevent. I mean, that's everything that lives essentially in the mouth. So um, that's why I, I like Oracare. And it's not so much about, again, selling a product, but really providing a great standard of care. I never forget when I started in a 87. Yeah, I graduated in 87 and I owned my office and I had run an ad for a hygienist and um, this hygienist uh, came and she hadn't called or uh, she just came in and she just walked through the office and she started inspecting my office to see if it was good enough for her. I mean, she wasn't even, you know, she wasn't responding. She knew I, I was looking for a hygienist and she was walking around talking and all that stuff. and. Uh, I was just so mesmerized by her energy and her confidence and her karma. But uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I thought was so cool, she was so, she just walked out of hygiene school. Her name was Missy and uh, Josephitis. And she said uh, she had won the Hugh Freedy Golden Scaler Award in hygiene school. And she had it on a plaque. And, I mean, she did, this is back before resumes and PDFs. And she was holding this plaque of the of Hugh Freedy Golden Scaler Award. And I just thought, God dang, she was so cool and she's so passionate and everything. She's the best hygienist I ever had. Award. They still give that award. By Do the way. they really still give that yeah. award? Oh my I god! I didn't win that one in my class, but because I think um, Missy's now, I think I think now she's like 109 or 114. Uh, but yeah, but uh, yeah, she was great. Then she quit because she had uh, three kids. But you won the Procter and Gamble Excellence in Patient Communication Award. Tell me what that's all about. So that was, I mean, uh, just a that was more of a shock, and you know. I, unlike so many other people that have been on your podcast, I wish I had the long list of credentials that they have. I'm building mine. I'm working on it currently, uh, but right now that's my claim to fame. Um, I, what, why that award meant something to me is because I went to school right out of high school. There was never a question if I was going to go to college or not. It was, you're going to college. So I said, okay, started at Penn State. Um, and was studying communication and thought, what am I going to do with this when I graduate? I have no idea what I'm going to do with this. So then I was like, you know what? I'm going to do dental hygiene. So I went to dental hygiene school, transferred to West Virginia University, and realized that I had four and a half more years on top of the two years that I was like, okay, I'm going to finish my communication degree kind of as a, you know, let me get out of this part of my life and let me move on to the next part. I have to finish because I started school. I want to I want to finish that bachelor's degree. So I kind of got my communication degree, although I found it very interesting and I liked it, um, just because I had been in school for a certain period of time. So whenever I found dentistry and I, you know, knew that that dental hygiene was what I wanted to do, 
and I graduated and I finished, I realized, you know, people are always like, why do you have a degree in communication? I realized how I can kind of merge those, especially coming into a practice like um, Dr. Martino's, because communication is so essential for a team. And I think having that background, especially with what I'm doing now, uh, you know, really promoting relationships, getting to know people and networking, that's an important part of being a dental hygienist. Um, you know, I, I read blogs and stuff all the time, posts from other hygienists, how, you know, they hate their career. I feel like I'm coming from a um, genre of hygienists who are telling people, don't go into dental hygiene school. It's awful. It's terrible. Um, and I don't feel that way. I love dental hygiene. Um, I love, I still love the clinical aspect of it, but I also have fallen into that trap too of, I went to dental hygiene school. I don't feel like I can grow. There's so many opportunities out there. You just have to know how to seek them out. And that's why I love the communication side of things and why I feel like I am here today. And I'm building that um, resume as we speak, hopefully. So you were born in Pennsylvania? Yes. Were you, uh, did you ever go to an Amish dentist? <laughs> no, but I have uh, driven behind some, quite a few buggies. Um, <laughs> I, so, so do you recommend Amish dentist or Mennonite dentist? Which one of those two would you recommend? Have you ever seen an Amish or Mennonite dental office? You know, the Amish and Mennonites will go to a regular dental practice. Um, I, and I will, they don't even need anesthesia. They are the toughest people ever. <laughs> oh my God, they're tough. What, what, what's the other, it's Amish, Mennonite, what's the other one that's uh, close to them? Um, truly, you know, everybody thinks Pennsylvania is covered in Amish. I grew, there was a, I don't know, a group of them, like maybe 20 miles from my parents' house, but I, I truly never saw that many. <laughs> you never saw that many? So, yeah. uh, I, I, uh, there's a, the largest population of Mennonites, believe it or not, is where I was from in Kansas. Kansas has... Uh -huh the largest midnight population. Yeah, I know that. And it is uh, so, uh, it's so cute to be behind uh, a Mennonite uh, buggy and horses or whatever and see this little girl on the back that's uh, six years old and all dressed up in her outfit on her iPhone. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, okay. Uh, <laughs> those three things usually don't go together, but they <laughs> sure do. So so explain what, what uh, how you get um, the Hugh Freedy Golden Scale Award or the Procter & Gamble Excellence of Communication Award. How do you actually get that? Is it a nomination? Is it a... Mine, I mean, I think mine came from my teachers. I think they voted on it as a group, I believe. Um, now, as far as the Golden Scaler Award, I believe it goes off of your grades in clinic. You know, how many scaling and root planings did you do? What grades did you get on those? Um, more of a clinical evaluation is what the golden scaler is. I will say I feel like it's a little more of a prestigious award um, because it's going off of your actual skills in clinic. That's interesting because when I graduated from dental school, Hugh Freedy said they refused to sell me instruments. <laughs> they they looked at my resume and my my grades and they said uh, we will never your 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 offer list. So um so um. What's got you passionate about, um, what else has got you passionate about dental hygiene? You know, I, I was lucky enough again to come in working for Dr. Martino. He introduced me to hygiene mastery um, because, you know, you go to school, you learn the skill. You, everyone comes out of school with the same level. Everyone knows how to do it. But it's learning how to talk to your patients about what you're doing, um, creating value in appointments, and I feel like that – has me really excited. And where I learned that from is Hygiene Mastery. Um, it's basically a group of hygienists that come in and are consultants. Uh, I think sometimes consultants get a little bit negative of a light, but I think my, the consultant that works for our offices is definitely my mentor. Um, her name is Shannon Richkowski. Anytime a hygienist, in my opinion, can elevate themselves um, to the level that she has or many of her other um, co-workers have um, I just think is amazing and I think that really trying to raise the standard of care and dentistry is what I consider myself to be trying to do um, and that's what I has me the most excited and Try who was your coach did you say her name is Shannon Richkowski oh she isn't she the uh, the owner of that so is it because you guys have eight offices you got the big dog 
Um, you know, I don't think I don't think she was the owner at the time when she started. I don't know. I think it was under someone else. But now, yes, she is the owner, and we do have the big dog. But she's well worth the big dog name. Um, she's amazing and just has a great way of explaining things and talking to you about, you know, providing that great standard of care to patients, which is what it all really comes down to. It shouldn't be necessarily about making money. It should be about creating a great standard of care that is going to create that income for your office. So they're located out of uh, Colorado. Yes. So- I, well, she, that's where she was living. Um, and I believe working out of there, her, she is a military wife. So they have moved from Colorado to Texas to, I believe now they're living in Washington, D.C. So I think wherever she lives is where that's run out of. Huh. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing group. Now, or you also had mentioned uh, Fortune Practice Management, which was uh, Tony Robbins' group. Is hygiene mastery associated with uh, Fortune Practice Management, or is that two separate deals? Um, I think that they are associated, but I believe they're also separate at the same time. Um I know they kind of go hand in hand. I know Fortune Practice Management recommends hygiene mastery a lot. So I'm fair. I think Shannon was a coach previously, but I'm again, I'm not sure. That's me kind of trying to remember a little tidbits I've heard along the way. Yeah, I think uh, Shannon is amazing. So what what name a few pearls that Shannon uh, share with you uh, that might uh, make my uh, homies uh, want to get a consult? I, I I'm a huge proponent of consult because. When you're my age, and you know my, my practice uh, turned uh, 29 uh, September 21st uh, this very month. This well, is the 27th. Birthday. Yeah, yeah, happy 29th, and and I'm gonna have a big shindig on the 30th. And um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, just just amazing. But you know, dentists will go by. You know, they don't blink at a hundred thousand dollar laser or a hundred thousand dollar CAD cam or a hundred thousand dollar CBCT. And then you say, well, why don't you go spend half of that on a consultant? And I just, whenever, you know, the dentists that I know that have been out as long as I have 30, 40 years that are all doing like two to four million a year, they, I mean, if you say to them, have you ever used a consultant? They're like, dude, I've used like every consultant. And they, and, and they'll tell you that every single one of them taught them something. And, you know, some of them, uh, like a friend of mine, Jerome Smith, that always uses Sandy Pardue. You know, he's had her come out every year for, you know, decades. Other ones will try several, you know, and, and I just, I just, don't know of hardly a single dental office that didn't get all their money back within six months. And then some, I mean, you need uh, motivation, you need ideas, you need something fresh. I also noticed um, with my team that, you know, I've had the same dental assistant since day one, 29 years. So when I say something, I'm just dumb, stupid, old, fat, bald Howard, trailer <laughs> trash from Kansas, born in a barn. What the hell would I know? But when someone shows up, in a suit, in a briefcase, and a presentation, it just mesmerizes the whole team, and and you just get so much more return on investment than deciding that you're going to start doing an oral scanner from you know uh, on your impressions. So so what what does Shannon? How, how many how, how long have you been working in this office? How many times have you seen her come in? So I'm working for this office for two and a half years. Um, I've seen Shannon, well, not a lot more now with Orcare because she's at shows and stuff like that. But um, she comes to our office and once a year and does a workshop with all the hygienists in every location. We all come to the same place and we do a workshop. And Dr. Martino will tell you kind of exactly what you were just saying. You know, he can tell us as hygienists to do something, but he's like, I swear when it comes out of her mouth, it's like, magic everything she says to us we're like okay yes we're gonna do that and then she does coaching calls with us i would say roughly every two months every every couple months and she kind of holds our feet to the fire make sure making sure that we are doing what we promised that we would do um and you know a lot of the things that i've been saying throughout this podcast come from her a lot of my belief systems come from her um the fact that you know Production is an important part of a practice, but um, when you provide a great standard of care, that production comes automatically because a lot of times those two things go hand in hand. So stuff like that is is what has come from her. And she really, you know, you do have people who don't want to feel like they're selling. She's going to help you get over that hurdle very easily because it's not about selling. It's about providing a really great standard of care 
to every patient that walks in the door um, and closing the back door, keeping that patient a lifelong patient. Well, when you get off the podcast that you call Shannon, you tell her that the short, fat, bald Dennis in Phoenix has been trying to get her on my podcast for two years, <laughs> two years. Tell her I've got, I, I, look, I've got on my body. I've had, I got Gordon Chris and Carl Mesh, John Coys. Uh, I've got uh, Peter Dawson and I can't get Shannon. You tell Shannon that uh, um, I'm going to come all the way to D.C. And uh, as, soon as, as soon as Obama is done with his presidency, me and Obama are going to uh, call her up on her office. But yeah, I, I think what Shannon does is amazing. And, and who in their right mind wouldn't think that if a hygienist is going to work 200 days a year, that maybe one of those damn days you should shut down the office and work out the systems and logistics. I mean, I mean, you know, it's called ready, aim, fire, not just fire all day long and there's nobody's ready, there's no aim, no one knows their goals. And also what I love about consultants is when you go to a lecture and there's 400 people and Shannon's lecturing, I mean, you don't know what the other team members are thinking. You don't know if you're sitting there taking notes and saying, ah, she's, she's Einstein, and then the person next to you is thinking, that'll never work in West Virginia. She's from D.C. They all got money out there. Uh, that'll never work in our office. And when a consultant comes in and gets everybody together and gets to hear everyone, it's another reason I think dentists shouldn't go to their staff meetings. Uh, I don't like going to my staff meetings because – um, when the dentist goes to staff meeting, it's basically a one hour lecture by the dentist. And when the office manager runs it or a consultant comes in, it's going around saying, you know, Hey, how, what, what do you think about that? I want to hear from Kristen, but the dentists always think that they should go in there and tell you, okay, we're in Phoenix and we're all driving to LA. We're not driving to New York. We're not driving to Utah. We're driving I 10. So they just go in there and they give this big old lecture, but they don't know what the staff is thinking. They don't know the staff thinking that. Well, we shouldn't be going to LA. We should be going to Albuquerque. And, and so consultants are just amazing. So tell me the same about fortune practice management. So fortune practice management, my Dr. Martino is kind of, he's actually a member of what's called the platinum circle. Um, they are kind of the initial investors actually in Oracare and they are kind of an elevated form of fortune practice management. They are kind of the original um, people who, and you know, were investing in, people coming in and coaching their offices. Uh, Paul Bass, who is the big gun, essentially, at Fortune Practice Management. What's is his the name? One, Paul Bass. Like um, the fish? He, yep, just okay. like that. Better looking, though. No. <laughs> Better looking than a bass fish? <laughs> um, but he was my boss's, Dr. Martino's, coach. Um, so he was the one who initially started a lot of these you know, protocols and we've just kind of built on them and made them work for us over the years that, you know, we don't really have a fortune practice management coach coming to our office. We have kind of mastered that. I say that very loosely, if you will, we still get input from them. They still give us feedback. We're a part of a lot of different things with them. Um, but we don't have the coach. Dr. Martino essentially is our coach. He is the one telling us what protocols we should be running, how we should be doing things. And, you know, what the rules that we're living by in this dental office, you know, how, how do we want to treat our patients? You know, our motto is to treat our, our patients like our family. And that's what we want to do. That sounds amazing. And, uh, um, you said that they, they're affiliated with Tony Robbins. Yes. Did you know that I, uh, podcast interviewed him? Oh my gosh. Yeah. You yeah. should go back. Uh, you can find him on uh, iTunes, YouTube, dental town, but yeah, I did, um, I, uh, was able to get uh, Tony Robbins on there, an amazing man, and he wanted to come on because he's gotten involved with dentistry on that uh, America's 401k, uh, mm -hmm. where it's basically uh, so much less fees and all that stuff. So, uh, so how, so how often does, um, how often does, if if you said your guy Robert Martino is your fortune uh, coach, uh, you said Shannon uh, brings in all the hygienists once a year. You guys don't see patients for one day, right? Correct. Um, how often um, does Robert Martino do that? Does he, for does he bring in all the offices one day a year, shut everybody down, and do this? Or so um, it's we are big here in West Virginia. Uh, what we do is winter meetings. Uh, so once a year, uh, we kind of bring each office in each of the eight locations. We just open up a, a 
uh, Tots and Teens Dentistry here in West Virginia. Um, so that's relatively new. It just opened back in July. And so, but every winter, we have a big winter meeting. Everybody looks at the numbers for the year. You're setting goals for the next year, things you want to strive for, um, you know, as far as a perio percent or maybe a sealant percentage. Uh, we kind of have a system here to keep track of all of those things. And, you know, it really allows you to look at the hard numbers. What were you focusing on, you know, in 2015 versus 2016? And it kind of gives you a grade for your practice and you really discuss and talk about how you want to make, grow that practice, make it more successful. And he'll do that from the end of November all the way up until our Christmas break, bringing each office in for one full day of a winter meeting. That is amazing, man. You you did. You you said at the beginning of the podcast that you felt very fortunate uh, that you uh, um, walked into a really uh, neat operation and all that stuff. It sounds like you, you really did. Uh, so um, I went to, um, I only got you for another uh, four minutes. Um, communication in a dental office. Um, you know, the most difficult part of dentistry um, is the patient, not how to do a root canal. The most difficult part of uh, life is the other 7 billion monkeys walking around, um, you know, and, and they don't always agree on religion, politics, everything. Um, what advice would you give being a hygienist to the dentist? Uh, what, what do the hygienists uh, sit there and say, I wish I could tell my dentist this, or how, how could a dentist work with a hygienist better? Uh, give, give, give all the dentist advice on how they could work better with their hygienist. That, you know, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, again, I'm lucky, so I always say I feel like I can have very open and honest communication with Dr. Martino, who is the one who makes the de decisions. I think it's allowing that comfort and allowing some a hygienist to feel safe with you, knowing that you know they can come in and say, "Hey, I think this team member isn't doing it." they're kind of causing a, a downward spiral for another member of the practice or, um, you know, being open to things like new products and going in and talking about it. Being, I think allowing for that open, safe communication, because I think a hygienist and a dentist or a hy hygienist and anyone in the office, it's almost like a good marriage. Um, you know, in the dental office, you have to get that right chemistry to really get it to work. And I think being open and not, I kind of like that you said that you don't go to your uh, office meetings because I think it allows for open communication amongst the team. But I think having that taken back to you and being able to communicate any problems that may be happening. Um, I just think that the communication part is so essential and, you know, feeling safe enough. Sorry about the noise. Um, feeling safe enough to talk to your dentist um, is, is important. And I think that's where a lot of hygienists struggle. So you, so you agree the dentist shouldn't go to the staff meetings? I mean, I, I kind of like, I never thought of it until you said that. Um, but I know from experience, you know, in other dental offices that I've worked in, when the dentist comes in, it does kind of put a little bit of a, you know, it's, it is your office at the end of the day. Um, however, I have to work there also. So it's knowing how to um, maybe iron out some problems and coming in and, you know, then being a part of the team, you know, what do you guys need me to know that I well, think? Let, well, let me say this. Do you think when the dentist is there, less staff feel free to speak freely? I think it, depending on the dentist. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think I, I don't think everybody has that. Now, Dr. Martino came in to, to one of my meetings whenever I wasn't working with him directly. Now I work with him directly every day. So I'm much more comfortable. When I was in the office and he would come in, I was I was thinking, oh gosh, something really bad's gonna happen today. You know, there is a little bit more of there's a little fear there that sometimes you don't always feel open to to say the things that you really need to say. Okay, so let's say there's five positions in the office: the dentist, the hygienist, the assistant, the front desk, the office manager. I want you to rank them from most crazy to least crazy. Who would be the craziest of those five? And then who I'm would gonna, be there? I'm going to admit it's going to be the hygienist. It's the, me. The I'm hygienists crazy. are the craziest in the office? Yep. And who, yep. who would be next? Uh, probably the dentist. But, uh, and why is the hygienist crazier than the dentist? Well, I think I, I know as a hygienist, you know, I'm, this is me, type A, I kind of micromanage. 
I do assisted hygiene. And sometimes it's really hard for me to give anything to my assistant. She is beyond capable of doing all of these things. But for some reason, I want to hold on to it so tightly that I can't let it go. And that's something, you know, with hygiene mastery, that was something I really learned was I'm holding up all of my straws so tightly, but I can get some help. And I think what makes me crazy is I'm super uh, time oriented. I always say we have um, Eagle Soft in our office. When I see that yellow dot come on for my next patient, I immediately start having a panic attack. So I know I'm not the only hygienist that's like that. Um, and I might catch a lot of heat for saying that the hygienist is the craziest one. But as a hygienist, I'm going to say myself, I'm the craziest one. <laughs> Now, in your office, are the hygienists allowed to order supplies, or does the dental dental um, dentist order them for you? Um, we can all, we can request anything that we really need. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make the cut because we have a budget set. Um, so normally, you have to either sometimes we have to give up something else if we need it. But if we have basic needs, so if we need profi paste or fluoride, you know, we can definitely get those things. But if I want like a new scaler or a Cavitron tip. You know, there is, you know, sometimes you have to give up something else to get something like that. Anything that, you know, adds an additional cost, a, a significant cost. Have you ever posted about all this on Hygiene Town? No. I you posted on Hygiene Town when I first um, signed up, which was probably two, a year and a half to two years ago. And nobody said anything to what I said so that I was like, maybe I'm not equipped but that that would be a good question you know i don't uh, um you know yeah i'm not sure you know dental town is just anybody working full-time in dentistry it's probably 80 percent dentist then the rest hygienists assistants office managers consultants manufacturers the whole nine yards um we did do a separate community for hygienists and orthodontists because they requested it, it wasn't our idea uh, but the hygiene, uh, I, I think there's far more hygiene discussion on dental town than there is hygiene town i think hygiene town is more discussions where they don't want the dentist there uh, but uh, I, you should. Uh, um, we'll we'll post this on uh, this podcast on Dental Town, and uh, it'll stir up a lot of conversation. But hey, I just want to tell you that uh, I uh, I love your youth. You remind me so much of my oldest son, Eric. Uh, I enjoy your uh, your enthusiasm, your knowledge. I just like everything about you. I love your energy, your karma, and also the viewers of the show. They always tell me that you know, um, like I just interviewed Peter Dawson. Well, you know, hell. Him and Gordon are in their 80s. No, no they don't want to listen to 80-year-old men all day. Uh, they want to hear uh, people at the other end of the journey and 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 fresh and, and all that stuff. So I just want to tell you that I, I really enjoyed you being on my show. I think you're amazing. Love your energy. Love your knowledge. Love your karma. I love everything about you. My last question is, because we're past an hour, we're in overtime, is uh, since your husband married a hygienist, does that mean that you floss his teeth for him every day and he never will ever have to floss his teeth the rest of his life? Um, I wish he would let me floss his teeth. Um, no, but I will say I am, he hate, this is him around me a lot of times trying to like bat his, my hands away from his face. Cause I'm constantly checking and I'm like, Oh, you need to floss. I think you should get that filled. Uh, we should do a micro on that too. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's an awful experience for him. He actually does not like me to be his hygienist when he comes into the office. He would prefer my coworker, Courtney. <laughs> over me any day but who, who ends up cleaning him? you or courtney courtney usually oh my gosh he's putting his foot down <laughs> unbelievable well hey uh seriously kristen thank you so much for uh coming on my show and i hope you uh when you see me you don't act like a good fella and take me out back and uh whack me i'll try i'll try i'll try to restrain myself okay i don't want to be off by are you italian also i'm not i'm actually irish and polish Oh, okay. Well, at least you're not Italian and a good fellow. That, that gives me some hope. But hey, thanks so much for coming on the show. Have a rocking hot day. Hey, thank you. You too.